Good morning. Well, this is a really good sign. I always like it when there's more people in the audience than there are on the panel. I was a little bit worried about that. So um, this session is called Health from 30,000 Feet. For those of you who do not wish to participate in the Imperial Metric Culture War, that is 9,144 metres. Um, so COGEX is, as, uh, as Sarah said, all about understanding transformational change. And where better to explore that in health? Health is something that affects us all. Certainly at some point or other in our lives, we all have some form of health. And this is a really fantastic opportunity to get a bird's eye view, to see what's going on across various areas of the health sector, from technology for, to patient care, to the latest ideas that are coming through from, from startups and exciting biotechs. And how do we actually make that work within the context of our NHS and then taking a more global perspective? How do we share our learnings with the wider world? Now, health has been on our minds uh, over the past two years. I don't know, obviously, this is the first pandemic kind of mention of the day. If you're doing bingo, you can fill that in. Um, also, it has brought unprecedented change. So fill in your unprecedented uh, tick on your bingo card as well. And the COVID-19 pandemic, it has exposed our weaknesses in our health systems. It's also brought about strengths, new ideas, challenges and opportunities. It's shown us that we can do things. It's accelerated things that we were already doing and, uh, and provided a lot of new ideas for the future. So as we gradually move into what I hope is a sort of a, a post-COVID or at least a living with COVID world, we did want to ask four leaders in the world of health what they think about the changes they've seen, the challenges that they're facing in their worlds and the opportunities that lie ahead. And these four leaders are, I'm very delighted to be joined by Chris Wigley. Chris is the CEO of Genomics England. Uh, they exist to push insights from the cutting edge of genomics into routine medical care. Thanks very much, Chris. We have Jacob West, Director of Health and Life Sciences at Microsoft. He leads Microsoft's health and science life sciences business in the UK. We have Joanna Holbrook. She's Chief Scientific Officer at Cambridge Epigenetics, where they're building and commercializing DNA sequencing tools and software to read more information from DNA. Now, my PhD was actually in epigenetics, so I'm going to try not to nerd out too much with Joanna, but uh, it's a very interesting area. Check it out. And finally, Catherine Pollard. She's Director of Tech Policy at NHS England, responsible for the Joint Digital Strategy and Policy Unit, the Transformation Directorate of NHS England. And that is a big, big job. So big round of applause for our fantastic panel. So I want to start with trends. Um, obviously, you know, this is a kind of standard conference question. Lots of things have changed over the past two years. And I, I wanted to get from each of you a sense of, you know, how your world has changed. Um, mostly professionally, if there's been any big uh, personal changes you'd like to share, please do. But um, we'll start with Chris Singh, as you're here on my left. So how, how has the, the world of genomics and, and the kind of work that you do changed through the past two years? What have you seen happening? Well, it's been a fascinating couple of years for anyone involved in healthcare and uh, particularly genomics and in many ways terrible in many ways I think in response to the crisis we've seen some of the best of the ecosystem kind of come together. I think if I was going to pick out a couple of themes one would definitely be genomics coming into the mainstream so to speak and obviously the big um, driver of that has been the pandemic. Um, friends of mine, um, my parents, um, you know random people you meet in the street suddenly you have very coherent conversations about pathogen genomics, about human genomics, about T cells, about B cells, in a way that a couple of years ago was kind of unimaginable. Um, so I think it's come to the forefront of all of our um, kind of conversations through this time. Um, specifically for Genomics England, I joined only just before um, the pandemic. And so we've changed a lot. Um, we've, we've grown a lot. We've, um, we've responded to a lot of um, those pressures. And for us, genomics coming into the mainstream has involved things like launching the world's first um, sort of health system wide whole genome sequence based diagnostic service in partnership with uh, the NHS, which has been amazing. And we're now getting thousands of patients through that uh, service every month, um, as well as doing lots of uh, research work through the pandemic. Um, and now um, kind of looking ahead, I guess, to the next chapter on how we can really bring the benefits of th those kinds of genomic medicine, those kinds of insights to everyone. Um, Jacob, how has your world changed? Thanks, Kat. Well, ch channeling a bit of remembered Dickens, this feels a bit like the, the best of times and the worst of times. Um, so I'm, I'm both hopeful and a little concerned um, when I think about the interface between 
healthcare and technology in particular. So concerned because if you look at the NHS, it's, uh, it's got this lowest level of public satisfaction for the last 25 years. It's got more than 6 million people waiting for planned care. Um, you've got a workforce uh, under real pressure, uh, pretty burnt out. But I also feel optimistic. Um, if you think about the pace at which technology uh, was rolled out and adopted um, under conditions of expediency, uh, it was just, it's truly transformational. One example, Microsoft Teams rolled out to 1.2 million people, health and care staff, in a matter of weeks during the pandemic. I think we put to bed some of the lazy myths about the pace at which healthcare systems can adopt um, innovation. And then, sort of symbiotically linked to that um, uh, uptake in technology, we've got this longer run trend, this explosion of data. Um, you know, I, I know one CEO of a large pharma company told me they had accumulated more data in the course of the first quarter of the pandemic than they had in their entire history. So this is huge. Um, but, but, and there is a but, um, the technology is not integrated generally or deployed at scale and the data is largely unstructured, messy. Um, so there is a job in front of us, and that's part of what we, with many other organizations, are trying to fix. How do you help organizations uh, engage with that messy health and care data ecosystem? Thank you. Uh, Joanna, how, how has your world changed? Um, it's been a pretty awful couple of years, um, but it's happened now. And now, I think, these decades in the middle of the 21st century, this is going to be remembered as the era where healthcare completely changed, was transformed. Um, and that's because the science is there. Our ability now to read and to edit DNA is transformative. We're going to be able to treat um, and maintain health on an individual level. That's incredible. And I've always worked in preclinical research. I've always been really excited about the science. And right now, um, our abilities have really come to pass. Um, but what's not been there is the infrastructure. And this is what Chris and Jacobs were saying. It's seemed almost impossible that this is going to get to clinic, um, that we have, that we can change a moving machine, which is under a huge amount of pressure. Um, and yet, within the pandemic, so much has changed. Um, vaccines made by newfangled RNA technology have been developed, have been approved, have been delivered population-wide. We're routinely now doing in-house testing and it feels like the trust is there and some of the will is there. It's huge problems to come, but I have hope that when the science is ready, it will get delivered and we'll be able to maintain health. So I take that as a positive that it happened now. Um, and then I also, and this is a bit more personal, um, I know a big change in my colleagues and the candidates we're hiring a lot at the moment and we're interviewing a lot of scientists. And there's a shift in people's motivations. We've all re-evaluated our lives during the pandemic. Time spent away from our loved ones has to have real purpose. And I see um, that people are very driven to have immediate application of their work. Scientists are always fascinated by science, but now they need to get something that's useful and usher in this new era. Um, so I'm coming out um, a little bit bashed, but in hopeful um, for the future. And I will just flag that um, some of the technology Joanna's talking about, our ability to read, to write, to edit DNA, we'll be discussing that at a session at the end of the day in this room called the Genesis Machine. So if you're interested in sort of future DNA technologies, do you make sure you come back for that one. And then finally, Catherine, the NHS, we're you know, one of the biggest players, obviously, in our response to the pandemic and at the kind of cutting edge of delivering all this technology. How has your world changed over the past two years? Yeah, well, it's certainly been a bit of a roller coaster. Um, like Chris, I started at what was NHSX just before the pandemic, um, and I don't think I've ever worked quite so hard in my life as those first um, those first few weeks and months. And I mean, Jacob's already talked about some of the the kind of healthcare challenges that we now face um, and that patients kind of face day to day. But um, I think I guess I'd also want to reflect on what it's been like for our staff. Um, I mean, we have. Um, we have seen the brilliance of commitment um, and how many extra miles so many of our frontline professionals of all walks of life will have gone. And indeed, even sitting in a national role, you know, the 
we had staff who just turned their hand to things they were completely unfamiliar with and just embraced it with the kind of the skies of getting on. Um, I think actually that has been a really helpful kind of cultural norm of breaking. I mean, the NHS is, is often seen as kind of very rigid and procedural. And I think actually um, one of the biggest things that we, we've achieved through the pandemic is an ability to work out how we can make decisions quickly, test, uh, adapt, learn, improve in a much more rapid cycle. Um, and I think certainly um, one of the kind of legacies of, of NHSX we really hope is that we, we put a couple of the basic premises of how you design good products, like user centeredness and, you know, rapid action cycles. Um, uh, and not doing kind of these big, big, big waterfall-based programs that we've instilled that not just in what we do nationally, but also much more in kind of how the NHS thinks and feels. Um, I think I, like Jacob, am hopeful, but very kind of cautiously um, because because of this workforce situation, um, we are we you know we don't have the great, the greatest set of retention numbers at the moment. We have a massive recruitment challenge um, and. But I do think that through digital technology data, we can give our staff a much better proposition um, and the tools that they need to, to hopefully feel more satisfied and fulfilled in their jobs. And I guess the, the challenge that you're facing is basically you're turning the NHS from a, a purely sort of medical organisation to a, a tech org and having to think about it in that more uh, agile way, you know, in, to get stuff done in the way that you know, smaller health startups might. And this is, I guess this isn't just a problem that's restricted to the NHS. Any large healthcare service is having to start to think about this. And in terms of the, the data issue, actually, Jacob, I want to come back to you and start with you to open up a discussion about the challenge of the kind of data that we, we need to gather, we are gathering, and how do we deal with it? So what do you see as the, the biggest data challenge, Jacob? You did mention like sort of interoperability and things like that where, where where's the big issue well there's so much bloody data which is um <laughs> both amazing but a challenge you know i, I saw one estimate in the ft recently 30 percent of the, the world's data i don't know how they get to these estimates is you know in the healthcare industry and, and probably as much again outside of it so you know it's both structured and unstructured it's um routinely he uh, collected healthcare data it's genomic data it's lifestyle accumulated data it, um and but actually almost none of that data is that useful in its own silo so the, the point is about how you connect it so interoperability you're absolutely right is at the heart of it how do you how do you ingest normalize uh, make secure in modern infrastructure uh, data in a way that can then allow it to speak to other bits of data um, microsoft has a set of healthcare apis which do just that uh, but you then, beyond the, the ingestion of the data, you need to analyze on top of it. So what are the analytical tools um, uh, and how then do you turn it into collaborative action? How do you allow the system, the team, you know, Atul Gawande talked about this being the, the century of the system for healthcare. It's not just about the heroic individual. So that cycle between data, data ingestion, data in, analysis and, and data aggregation, uh, sorry, data collaboration is, is fundamental to getting, realizing the value from that a huge accumulation of data that we have. And I guess one of the, the challenges is that we're dealing with increasing atomization. So uh, kind of, Catherine, how, how are you seeing it? We're seeing a lot of private healthcare companies trying to deal with the NHS, lots of startups, all these different forms of data. Um, is, is that kind of atomization of the, the health data landscape an issue? Yes, and I think, um, if anything, it is, um, is something that we have really crystallized um, in our kind of perspective nationally. Um, and actually today our data strategy for health and social care is being uh, published, so later on, please look out for it. Um, and it talks about kind of um, a number of big systemic challenges we need to make to harness the potential of health data. One is about public trust and transparency, which is incredibly important, getting really clear with the public about how we're using the data and making sure that we have the highest level of ethical standards, actually something that Genomics England do very well. Um, but, um, but the other thing is, to your point around atomization, that we need to um, probably look a 
bit more strategically than just expecting that through um, having great standards that we'll be able to seamlessly flow hundreds and hundreds of different data points to each other. Um, and so we're going to be starting to make some quite big national investments in things um, we call secure data environments, so data platforms that will be used by the NHS um, and particularly our integrated care systems to be able to analyse their waiting lists, analyse their populations, see where there might be health disparities that they're not aware of, and then also to make it available to the research community in a much more um, uh, streamlined but also secure manner. So picking up some of the recommendations from the Goldacre Review. And so, Joanna, your, your company, Cambridge Epigenetics, you're kind of wanting to add another layer <laughs> of data on top of all this data. So uh, tell me a bit about, about that. Like, what is this extra data layer and, and how, again, is that going to fit into all these other data streams? Yeah, um, it is an extra layer and it's um, a complex extra layer because it has, it's probably longitudinally needed. So epigenetics is the grammar of the genome. It tells you which of your DNA sequence is used and it changes over time and it changes with environment. So it changes at the beginning of disease. It changes in response to your, to what you do. So it, by looking at your blood, I can tell if you smoke, um, I can tell how many packs um, and whether you quit. Um, and I can also tell um, the consequences of childhood trauma and social deprivation. Uh, there is a huge amount of information there um, that we can use to track that individual disease. As Jacob mentioned, we're collecting lifestyle data. Lifestyle data is a nightmare. People lie. Um, it's incredibly um, difficult to capture and normalise. Actually, epigenetics is the interface of how your lifestyle affects your DNA. Um, so that information could be incredibly valuable and it could pick up disease before it happens. Um, but, it, but it's different in every tissue in your body and it has to be measured longitudinally. Um, it fits into the same kind of data systems that genetics fits into. Um, so all the Genomics England data um, is stored in a way that would work for epigenetics as well. Um, and in fact, the technology my company works on measures genetics and epigenetics together and uses the same file formats. So it's not a technical challenge to store the data, but it's an order of magnitude more data. Um, and um, it's an algorithmic challenge as well to understand, to model it across time um, and track it to outcomes that really matter. Um, and that's something I think that we are beginning to have the tools to do. So, Chris, I, I want to come to you now because this is this is basically like a big, big longitudinal problem. It's, it's always like, you know, space is not the final frontier. It's time um, when it comes to this stuff. So how from the genomic side of things, you know, how can we take this this view, this much more longer term view to understand how our genes, how our bodies, how our epigenetics all works together to affect our health. Because now we're starting like newborn sequencing, aren't we? So how, how's all that working and, and what's the perspective there from this, this much deeper longer term studying? Great question. I mean, I think as we look to the long term, um, we need to build on solid foundations and and I'll maybe come back to the long term in a second, but I think just to pick up on these, the points that my three colleagues have made, I think it's really important to understand that in health data terms, we to some extent live in a kind of post-apocalyptic landscape and we need to build a new and brighter future. Kind of, I'm a bit of a science fiction nerd. It's a bit like Isaac Asimov's foundation. Like we need to just build a new future that's different. I think the, the kind of megaton nuclear bomb was the national program for IT, MPFIT, which some people may still be having screaming nightmares about, um, which kind of left the community with this view that any consolidated technology or data infrastructure was a bad thing. Um, and I think that we as, a, as an ecosystem need to kind of get over that. Um, and th so that's like one big thing that we need to get over is we do need to make things interoperable. We do need to have national standards, ideally even international standards. We need to have a system that all talks to, talks to itself and different systems that talk to each other. Um, I think the second point just to pick up on the ethics piece is we had CareDoc data just last year. We had the GPDPR sort of confusion and uh, challenges. We need to have a new conversation with quote unquote the public and I don't think there is such a thing as the public when it comes to this different people have really different views on health data not least the simplest distinction is are you sick or are you well because if you're sick you have a completely different view about your health data than if you're well um, 
we need to land the basic points that it's not our data, it's their data, it's, it's the person in question's data, um, and we need to build the right systems that empower them, not just engage with them, but actually empower them to own that data and make meaningful decisions about it. Um, and I think if we can build on those two foundations, a sort of technology and data infrastructure that is truly national and, and systemic and, and interoperable, and an ethical foundation of um, you know, individual and, and communal ownership of data, not kind of technocratic ownership of data, then we're set up um, to do great things. Um, to turn to your actual question, sorry for sort of rambling first. It was a rambling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that wasn't the answer. That was just the, that was the that was the pre-answer. Well, um, a comment than a question. The um, the the newborns project that we're about to um, engage on is a great example of why we need both of those things in place. So we're about to sequence the genomes of a hundred thousand babies if their parents opt into um, to doing that. Um, Oh my God, you know, is there a situation where we need to be ethical about how we use this data? Yes, you know, right here. Oh my God, is there a system where we need to make sure that whatever data systems, whatever cybersecurity systems and so on, we're building a robust? Yes, absolutely. But the really exciting thing about that program is, to some extent, it's a hundred year project um, because, you know, people born today could reasonably expect to live to a hundred. Um, and these 100,000 babies will be the first group of humans um, ever born who grow up with their genome on file. And so one of the um, aims of the program is to screen those babies at birth for sort of early onset genetically driven conditions that are treatable and get them straight into treatment because we know that leads to much better outcomes. Um, a second is then to develop new drugs for um, conditions which are currently not treatable. And the third, which is the most um, kind of speculative, is to explore this question of what does it mean to grow up with your genome on file. Um, I'm going to stop talking in one minute, I swear. Um, the, I listen to a lot of music on Spotify, for example, and there's an there's a agreement between me and Spotify. I share my data, they make recommendations. And every week I get a new playlist and I'm like, wow, where's this song come from? This is brilliant. Um, the way I would frame this is we have an opportunity as the NHS, as the system here in the UK to say, how about a free lifelong subscription to recommendations about your health and well-being? It's based on the same kind of agreement. You're going to share your data with us. We're going to share recommendations with you. But instead of being a song that you like, it may be something that saves your life. It may be something that means you have a, um, a much greater degree of wellness and happiness in that life. Um, and I think that's an extraordinarily um, exciting opportunity for, for that cohort and for all of us over the next kind of 100 years and beyond. And the thing that sort of t tweaks me a bit about this is that as someone coming from a scientific background, you know, grants run for five years if you're lucky. Our governments turn around every five years if we're lucky. Um, this is really long-term funding. And, and as anyone will know, you know, sometimes you find a favourite computer service or software and then it's like, oh, no, we're not doing that anymore. Um, so I don't know if, if, Chris, you want to briefly start and then the rest of the panel. It's like, how do we actually make this stuff work for the the term, the duration, yeah. the next 50, 60, 70 years that we need to. I think sometimes things stick around. So like USB ports have been stable for quite a while now, which is great. <laughs> you know, I mean, we kind of have USB-C now. I think we need to make some kind of generational decisions as a community, not least on things like ontology, right? And about what is, what is, the, um, what is the, the one or two systems of organizing data that we all kind of commit to for kind of 20 or 30 years. And we realize that changing that is going to be a really big deal and we need to you know, it's not going to be perfect, but we need to make these decisions. So I think a lot of it for me is about actually lifting our heads. Now we've got this opportunity to, to rebuild, to, to build systems that work better and, and making some really strategic decisions um, and making them in a collaborative and engaged kind of way and hopefully making them well. Um, but we have to make some decisions. Otherwise, we live in a kind of, you know, Tower of Babel world where no one can talk to each other because everyone's suddenly speaking different languages. Jacob, from the, the, the tech world, you know, how do we sort of end up accidentally avoiding a, a MySpace of genomics or something like that? How do we actually make this stuff work for the long term? Well, uh, well I, th I think if you're thinking long-term investment, then, you know, what, one of the issues we need to address is the, the cost of clinical trials. Um, uh, you know, two, two and a half billion pounds or so uh, for t taking on average 10 years to bring a drug to market. How can we start to undercut that business model? How can we change the economics um, for the biotech and pharma industry so that they can make different and longer term investments? So that would be one addition. Uh, I think Chris described the solution, which is patient custodian data. Yeah. We own our data. We own our health data. We should get to choose who we share it with. 
um, we should get to choose whether we do data to a research cohort. There's plenty of precedence that people will share data um, to get something back. I mean, look at 23andMe. Um, people gave up their data with almost no controls um, to find out if they were half Viking or whatever it is. Um, you can, um, we should get to make those decisions and we can't look to big tech or public sector to build a system that's going to do everything because only we as patients know which healthcare we've interacted with, whether we've, whether we've seen private doctors, whether we've been abroad. Um, we, can, we need to have a solution where we hold our data and then wh however the systems change, however the algorithms change, we can choose to participate. So data that is interoperable, um, but is owned by the patients. Catherine, do you have something? Yeah. I mean, I think I think um, totally agree about effectively harnessing the citizens' expectations of how they use technology in everyday life, and then actually just trying to make sure that we're constantly responding to those, and that that weight of effectively consumer expectation on the NHS will create an inevitability that I'll need to respond to it. Um, the other thing that I think we can enable from a kind of national policy perspective is, so our NHS leaders do stick around. I mean, some of the, some chief execs have been in place for decades um, and they provide continuity and that long term view. And so if we can build within our, our kind of clinical workforce in our boards, that much more strategic perspective and a much more deep understanding and appreciation for digital and and seeing it as something more than just like a bunch of servers um, that their kind of IT manager hopefully keeps running. Um, then, then I think we've got the opportunity to be much more strategic and, and thoughtful about it. Um, something we can't do nationally, but we can definitely enable locally. So all this discussion is, is really exciting. I get very excited about the idea of like a, a tech and a data enabled healthcare system. But one thing that then I worry about is the risk that this will actually cause like, you know, with the, the data divide, that there's a risk of reinforcing health inequalities. People who are already poorly served by the health service may be more suspicious and, and you actually risk creating uh, people who are sort of forced away from this potential benefit. So um, again, a sort of a, a quick round the panel of how do we actually avoid exacerbating these health inequalities? What's, what's a good place to start? I'm going to start at the other end though. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. So um, I, think, I think kind of there's two things we can do. On the macro level, we can actually just make sure that by bringing lots of different data sets together, that we have a much richer picture um, and that we're able to have um, a much yeah, a much more sophisticated understanding of who might be being underserved. We've done that incredibly well, actually, with COVID vaccines. And, and that's enabled us to say, OK, there are certain communities that are not taking up um, vaccines in the way that we'd hope them to do. And then you work with community groups in a very analog way to effectively make sure that they're, whether it's trust issues, whether it's access issues, that those can be um, uh, overcome. And then I think um, the other thing is we've got, we're starting like a big program of digital inclusion. And I think we need to understand what's real and what's a myth in terms of what those barriers are. Um, we definitely know there are financial challenges to access. Um, so we're looking at things like how we can reduce the you know, the data costs if you're trying to access NHS services on your mobile phone and things like that. Um, but I think it has to start with quite a empirical, data-driven approach as to what the barriers are and which communities we really should be worried about. Because it's definitely not just, you can't just take like an age-based um, broad brush approach to this. Uh, Joanna. So I agree, absolutely. There's so much we need to do to reach out to people. But I also think we should do some active research. So I, I started as an academic, I moved into genetic epidemiology and I talked to all these epidemiologists and I was really shocked because social economic status predicts almost everything. Almost all health outcomes are pretty much um, predicted by social economic status. Epidemiologists know this and they just control it out because there's nothing they can do. It's just the big thing that happens. Um, what is it really about being poor that makes you sicker? Is it food? Is it the work you do? Is it access to healthcare? We know that there's actually, going back to epigenetics, there's actually an epigenetic signature of low social economic status that you can see in people's genome. And it's how you 
your social economic status when you were a kid, not when you're an adult. You can see that, you can predict what your, what, what your mother's education was and what your household income was just by looking at your blood when you're 40. Um, we need to work out what it is, what actually caused that problem, what is it that we need to intervene in, and we need to be able to measure if the interventions worked. So yes, we should absolutely reach out and we should try to convince people who have been badly and underserved to have faith in the um, medical systems. Um, but also we need to actually go actively and find out what it, how we are getting this so wrong. Jacob? I think we're right to be talking about inequalities. I mean, COVID um, shone a spotlight on them, didn't it? I think if you were from certain black and minority ethnic communities, you were had were more than twice as likely to die from COVID than, than white people like me. And that, you know, that sits on top of you know, inequalities in this country, which are staggering, really. If you, if you grew up in um, southwest London, Richmond, you, you, you can expect 18 years of more of healthier life expectancy than if you're a, a, a child growing up in, say, Blackpool, Northwest. Um, but, but I think the, the technology and inequalities debate sometimes becomes quite zero sum. So, so how can we create a progressive agenda around technology and, and exclusion or inclusion? Uh, and a couple of small pointers in that direction. So uh, if, if you have um, certain forms of neurodiversity, Technology can actually really improve your accessibility with healthcare because asynchronous communication it, it can, can really work for um, many communities. Um, and, and that's something we don't always pick up because it's a, a group of people who, who perhaps haven't articulated it um, in, in the way we like to hear. And, and then technology can also take away technology. If you think about ambient sensor technology, which is um, provided by companies like Nuance, recently acquired by Microsoft, you, you transform the patient-clinician encounter if, you, if the doctor or nurse is able to step away from their terminal and look you in the whites of the eyes and say, what's going on? Um, how can I help you? Uh, rather than spending you know, half their working week um, on clinical documentation. So, so technology can actually um, be progressive and I think we need to try and embrace that whilst um, not, not doing away with the, the, you know, the real inequalities that are out there. Chris, obviously getting people to participate in these big general mix problem, uh, programs, you do need to, to build trust. So how, how can we avoid entrenching inequalities in, through the, the work that Genomics England is doing? I think, um, I don't want to oversimplify, but I think that Joanna's point really resonates with me, which is you just got to do the work, right? You've got to get out there, do the work, right? So we've um, just been given funding in the recent spending review, um, which is great, on a program that we're calling Diverse Data. Um, Historically, again, I don't want to sound too post-apocalyptic, but I'm going to use this phrase again. We slightly live in a post-apocalyptic world in terms of diversity of these data sets and the, therefore the ability to serve people with personalized medicine. Um, pop quiz for the room, okay? Who's, who's feeling brave? What proportion of GWAS studies, genome-wide association studies, which are like in the papers when you read, scientists discover gene for X, um, you know, this kind of work. What proportion of those studies have been done exclusively on European ancestry genomes. Anyone? Who's feeling brave? Shout out a number. 95 is not quite that bad. Anyone? 85. 85%. Well done, sir. Um, so 85% of all of this work ever in the history of humankind has been done on European ancestry genomes because those are typically the largest population in the volunteer-led studies that have been done to date. The, your archetypal health study volunteer is an affluent 35-year-old woman living in Hampshire. So if you're a poor 75-year-old Afro-Caribbean guy who lives in Dagenham, um, it is really unclear whether the insights derived from those uh, volunteer-led data sets are going to be relevant for you in terms of your, your personalized health. So um, we've applied for and got dozens of millions of pounds to work on this. A, a big part of this is um, getting really granular about engagement. I made this point earlier about there's no such thing as the public. I think that's really, really important. There isn't a single view on this. We need to understand where different communities are. Um, and I don't think there's a lever we can pull that says build trust. Um, you know, it would, it, would be, it would be nice if there was a trust lever that we could just pull. I think the question for us is what can we do to be trustworthy? Um, how can we actually make sure that we are um, empowering patients, not just engaging with them about their data? Um, how can we make sure that we are protecting it and, and that we're 
letting patients make the decisions about who's getting access for what purpose to their data, um, that we're being completely transparent, that we don't have immortal cell lines that are derived from a patient who doesn't even know that anyone has those cell lines that then last forever, that tons of science goes down on, et cetera, et cetera, that we put the right legal constraints in place so that we don't um, allow health data to be used by, for example, the police or the insurance agencies um, so that we can be trustworthy, we can, we can uh, demonstrably do all of these things. So, but I think the fundamental point is, it's not about hand-wringing, it's about doing the work. It's about getting out there, doing the research, doing the work, building the right data sets, doing the research, making it happen. So now we're coming to the, the last 10 minutes. Um, I should have said at the beginning, I'm afraid with this session, we don't have time for questions because we have four panelists, a lot to talk about. Um, but if you do want to ask questions, do come and hang around at the end. Um, also, you can tweet your comments on social media. The hashtag, I believe, is hashtag COGXFestival22 and COGX underscore festival is the, the handle. Um, so we're going to come now to the opportunities. So I, I think we'll start at the end. Where do you see the big opportunities over the next coming 10 years? Catherine, for the NHS, big challenge um, from where we are coming out of the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to pick two distinct themes. One is about a problem I think um, we can solve and the other opportunities about how we go about doing it. Um, so on the kind of problem side of things, um, really, really practically, um, as I mentioned, we have this incredible workforce challenge. Um, if we embrace tech, the right type of technologies, be those AI-based ones, or really practical cl clinical decision support, or the automation of processes, um, particularly those that take away administrative tasks that are effectively low value adding, they can help us um, ensure that every interaction with a person is a meaningful one, um, and that we can provide a much perhaps broader set of um, healthcare practitioners to work as part of that holistic team. So really kind of thinking about it from a, an upskilling piece and one of the kind of key, um, if, if kind of, um, you know, entrepreneurs or innovators come and talk to me and they start to tell me about what they're doing, I'm like, okay, just think about how you can measure that in almost like minutes saved per, per member of staff because that's the metric that really, really resonates with the NHS. Um, but then the how has got to be through this partnership working. Um, we have some incredibly great pockets of excellent partnerships between the NHS and industry, both big tech and kind of emerging tech. And that's something that we really need to make much more systematic, widespread, um, so that we are no longer the the kind of, I guess, the customer that everyone is very reluctant to come and want to work with. Yeah, that, that's a, definitely a challenge. Um, Joanna, what, where do you see the opportunities coming? I'm really excited at the moment by uh, new findings happening in molecular aging research. Our DNA changes over time and as we age, and most of these changes happen in the epigenome. We used to think they were random, that damage just happened over time and there was wear and tear in the systems that were meant to maintain and fix the damage. Um, but really beautiful new work says that's not true. Actually, we have programmed changes in aging. They happen in the same place and in the same order over time, we have programmed obsolescence, like iPhones. Um, <laughs> and that's, but for us, the consequences of this inbuilt obsolescence are the diseases of aging, or Alzheimer's, cancer, heart disease. Well, now we know what this program is. Um, other scientists have managed to change the epigenome in cells in a dish in culture. You can make the epigenetic changes that move you from old to young and the cells change in their behavior and their phenotype from old to young. Um, so this is incredibly exciting research. Um, to me, at the very least, it's going to completely overturn everything we thought we knew about aging. And at the most, it will give us the path to intervene to, uh, at an individual level, correct that damage, the change in aging, and so prevent all the diseases of ageing. Um, so I'm very excited about that and watching it carefully. And that is one of the challenges that we didn't talk about is that, you know, we do face an ageing population, none of us are getting any younger and and most of the health conditions we experience do come with ageing. So yeah, that's yeah. definitely an Though infectious exciting. diseases have made some headlines, um, yes. still quite important. <laughs> Honestly, it's like I, I brought a book out about cancer two years ago and it's like cancer didn't exist in the pandemic. It's been <laughs> very frustrating. Yeah. Um, Jacob, where, where do you see the, the big opportunities? Three things I'd highlight briefly. Firstly, the, 
the, the power of voice. So we talked about data, but actually uh, this hidden set of data, the conversations we're having that, that you know, uh, typically in a healthcare uh, setting uh, uh, are not recorded, are, are not used, are not turned into um, a, a structured document. We, we can change that now. Uh, and the power of uh, technology can both enhance the patient clinician encounter, as I already mentioned, but also write it back immediately into a structured um, uh, electronic health record with uh, appropriate ontologies and AI-based tooling on top of that. And that is a game changer. Um, if you think in the NHS, there's about half a million uh, doctors and nurses, they're spending several hours a week on clinical documentation. This kind of technology can cut, cut, up, cut that by about 60 to 70%. So you're talking about tens of millions of hours. The second thing I think building on Catherine's comments is the practical applications of AI. Um, so AI gets talked up a lot. Um, it, it's not creationism. It's it's, it's, it, for, the, for the next 10 years, it's about optimization, and it does that best with high volume, repetitive tasks that are time consuming for the workforce. And we have, we have real examples of how you can do that now. Project NRI, developed by Microsoft Research with Adam Brooks Hospital, uh, which massively um, foreshortens the, uh, the workflow associated with contouring scans ahead of radiotherapy is one example. Companies like Ultromics uh, for echo echocardiograms, IASO for clinical decision support around mental health, they, they are all make, making practical application of, of that technology. So we don't need to look too far in the future to see that, how that can be applied well. And then thirdly, I think uh, uh, I'm really excited about the power of synthetic data. How do you turn small data into big data? Um, how do you uh, use digital twins? And, and what, what in particular can that be used to, uh, to drive the efficiency? How can that be used to drive the efficiency of clinical trials? I, I really love that idea of the, the, do you want to just unpack this idea of the digital twin just a tiny bit? I'm well, fascinated by it. well, I think, I think what, what we're looking at that, there really is, is, you know, so often we have uh, just a very, a very diluted set of data on people. How do you turn that into a much more powerful data set by combining multiple data sources, but using synthetic data to address all of the kinds of privacy concerns we talked about previously. So you can build effectively a, a digital version of someone and say, this is kind of pretty much like you. It's not exactly you, but it's using all the data we have. This is going to be a bit like you, so we can make them predictions about what is likely to happen to you, to your health, to your life. Precisely. Exactly. That's incredibly exciting. And uh, Chris, where do you see the opportunities? Um, so two themes for me. One is um, patient power, which I keep banging on about, but I think it's, it's so central to this. Um, digital twin, great. Um, if the health system has your email address, postal address, and phone number wrong, <laughs> then you know, that's, that's not great. And we know that simply by giving people access to their own medical records and saying, by the way, this is the phone number, the email address, and the address that we have for you. Are they right? And, and letting them update them if they're wrong. Um, you can fix a lot of those basic things. So again, I think we need to build on those foundations. So patient power would be one. The second one would be convergence. And I think it's convergence in a few different lenses. One is convergence of the ecosystem. What we saw in the pandemic was this ecosystem really pulling together clinical trials, research, clinical delivery, all, all coming together and really working um, in a mission-driven way on really big questions. And I think we need, we need to sustain that level of kind of ecosystem convergence. Um, I think the second is bringing together of science and clinical delivery, which tend to be thought of quite separately. But to your point about scientists want to see impact, the patients and their families want to see that impact as well, right? So how do we continually bring science into healthcare to bring those insights in and bring the data from healthcare into science? So really converge healthcare and science. And my third element of convergence is one that I guess touches on all of this around we need healthcare transformation um, or, we, or we need recovery of the system from the pandemic, right? Exhaustion of people, um, in systems that aren't going to scale economically, um, and we need digital transformation. And I think too many people still talk about health system recovery and digital transformation as though they're two things. I think they have to be one thing. Um, the only way that the workforce gets less exhausted and more empowered, the only way that the bringing these new kinds of insights to um, citizens and patients in this country is, is sustainable, is if those things become one thing. Thank you. And we've just got a couple of minutes. I've gone a kind of quick fire round now through the panel of what is your one to watch for the next five years? I mean, this could be a concept, an area of research, a therapeutic, a piece of technology, a company. Um, what, what have you got your eye on? And I think we will start with Catherine. Um, so I'm going to pick uh, clinical decision support as a category. 
So what, what exactly do you mean by that? So what I mean is um, effectively either using AI or machine learning or indeed just kind of automation. You've got a person sat in with a, a clinician with a patient. Um, how do you make sure that in that instant they don't miss something that um, they should have done because they were busy or distracted? Um, how do you make sure that they've got the most recent best practice or the most recent guideline from NICE at their fingertips that they can then um, trigger on, like um, ask a question about. Um, so how do you make sure that all of that depth of data that we have sat in the background is synthesized in real time such that the clinician can be prompted to ask the next set of really helpful questions that might unlock some future benefits? Thank you. Joanna, what's your one to watch? Um, I'm going to go back to the idea of patient owning their own data. I think that we are going to have this huge amount of data generation um, and it's going to happen partly within our health systems, but also um, as these technologies become more available, we're all going to start holding data and there's going to be a huge amount of private work. Um, people, are going to, people are interested in predicting their future and they want to make sure that it's something that they hold in the same way that I'm willing to give up some of my data to Google to get something back. Um, I think that we are going to find the private sector and the consumer sector pushing um, on the health, uh, our health systems. And I think that will be for the majority good. Thank you. Um, quickly, Jacob. I'm interested and excited about platform technology. Platform technology applied in healthcare delivery because we're moving away from um, the era of proprietary data stacks towards universal exchange, but also, and I know less about this, bio platforms. How, how do we change the economics of investing in um, the, the, the next thera therapeutic or drug by thinking very differently about things like mRNA and how they can be more than just individual products, but actual platform technologies? So you just put in an idea and it comes out the other end, put in another idea, comes out the other end. It completely changes the risk profile and the R&D profile. Thank you. And finally, Chris, what's your uh, one to watch? I think we've been waiting for it a long time. I think the predictive medicine bus might actually be about to arrive at the bus stop. Um, and ding. <laughs> ding, ding, right, hop on board. Um, I think, you know, the data is there, the science is there, the systems are almost there. You know, we're really, really, really getting there. You know, people were writing their doctoral theses about this in the 70s, but I think, you know, the bus is about to arrive. Get on board, folks. That is a very good place to end. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you to my fabulous panel. Please do share your thoughts on uh, Twitter. It's hashtag COGX Festival 22. And uh, if you're interested, come back here for half past four. I'll be talking about the Genesis machine, uh, which will be a fantastic tour of the future of genetic engineering. But thank you very much for our panel. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you.